I would like to welcome Dr. Joel Dudley for his grand rounds moving from precision medicine to next generation healthcare. Dr. Dudley received his master's and PhD in biomedical informatics at Stanford University School of Medicine. He held positions as co-founder and director of informatics at uh, New Medi Incorporated and consulting professor of systems medicine in the Department of Pediatrics at Stanford. Dr. Dudley is now an associate professor of genetics and genomic sciences and the director of the Next Generation Healthcare Institute here at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. His work explores ways to integrate the digital universe of information to better predict models of disease, drug response, and scientific wellness. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Dudley. That's great. All right. Just a guy trying to stay out of trouble. So this is great. Um, you know, sometimes I ever see the movie Office Space. Yeah, I, f I feel like the guy in Office Space who tries to get fired all the time but keeps getting promoted. <laughs> that's, uh, that's, that's who I am. Yeah, so. Um, so before I talk about specific research for projects we're working on, I'm going to talk about um, sort of the way we think, or at least at our institute, we think about the world, uh, which is, I think, somewhat a bit different than, than how people traditionally approach uh, problems in, in biology and medicine. And that's by first appreciating that there are rarely smoking guns in human health. What do I mean by that? Is there's rarely the magic gene, the magic uh, uh, you know, protein, the magic drug target that's the solution to all your problems. When we're looking at complex diseases, we're looking for through smoking gun chips. And what do I mean by that? Take a, a, a disease like inflammatory bowel disease. Genome-wide association studies have now found over 200 genomic loci associated with inflammatory bowel disease. You can roughly think of that as over 200 genes associated with inflammatory bowel disease. By the way, those 200 genomic loci don't yet explain 50 percent of the heritability of, of inflammatory bowel disease. So we're only halfway into the genetic component of IBD, and we're, we're, and we're 200 you know, genomic loci in and only explaining half of the See, so the question is, of course, where's the drug target or biomarker and all that mess, right? So it's the, the challenge we have. And we, I, when I I'm going to talk about some cool stuff we're doing to sort of make sense of this complexity, but I always like to put this type of slide up as a humbling kind of reminder of how hard this is. This is, uh, of course, a, well, this is a uh, figure from Nature Views Genetics where they're talking about cystic fibrosis. Uh, cystic fibrosis, I'm sure many of you are aware, monogenic disorder. Almost all the population prevalence or variability of the CF uh, trait is explained by mutations in a single gene called CFTR. So, and we know a single CFTR is a single causal genetic driver of cystic fibrosis. Uh, but, you know, even this one gene, one disease uh, uh, situation can give rise to all kinds of uh, complexities. So what they're showing in the figure here is, of course, all the different organ manifestations, which many are aware of, of the single. Uh, gene uh, can give rise to across the body. We often think, of course, about the lungs and maybe pancreas with cystic fibrosis, but of course it affects all these other organ systems. And, and of course, if you have backgrounds of other genetic markers, genetic factors, it can uh, cause variability in how the, the phenotype is expressed. So, but this shouldn't be surprising that a single gene uh, mutation can give rise to such physiological complexity because if we really think about what's happening under the, the hood of the human body, do um, we have these complex dynamic molecular networks? So think of a single cell just for a minute, just one cell, right? So we have three billion base pairs of DNA, right, in, in, inside of a single cell, and then the, that DNA gets expressed into all different types of, of RNAs. And I'm sorry to tell you, if you haven't looked at a genetics uh, textbook in a long time, it's not DNA to RNA to protein. That is, uh, that's like the. Uh, you know, the orbital uh, or Rutherford model of the cell or of the, of the atom or something, right? That's way oversimplified. We have DNA to a whole universe of RNAs, eRNAs, picoRNAs, mRNAs, link RNAs, uh, miRNAs, the list goes on and on. There's, there's a whole universe of RNAs you probably haven't learned about that then get expressed off that, that DNA and go back and bind to the DNA, bind to each other, regulate the DNA. Uh, some of those RNAs make proteins and make thousands of different proteins, forming complexes with one another, interacting with other proteins, binding back to the DNA, regulating the three-dimensional structure of the DNA. Some of those proteins will even help make metabolites, metabolites interacting uh, with all these different things. So we haven't left a single cell yet, right? So one cell has a whole constellation of these interactions of, of proteins, uh, RNAs, uh, 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 metabolite networks, et cetera. Of course, cells make uh, organs. And tissues, tissues, there's another layer of communication and networks and, and uh, organs are formed and organ systems, as you well know from your physiology class, interact with one another and of course the inner environment interacts with this uh, um, in all different ways. So humans are complex adaptive systems. Complex adaptive systems are actually a well understood phenomenon or, or a type of system and they have specific characteristics. 
So complex adaptive systems evolve over time. There's interactions like I just talked about. Um, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And even though we know that you really can't understand the whole system by looking at its individual parts, we keep trying to do this over and over again in biology and medicine. But we know we shouldn't do this because humans are because uh, this is not how you study complex adaptive systems. And who said this? Uh, this is a nice quote from an investment banker in Harvard Business Review. So for as much grief as we give all the bankers, they have a pretty darn good understanding of complex adaptive systems and how to study them uh, versus biologists and clinicians, to be honest. So once I get a clinician with a good, or a biologist with a quote as good as this one, I'll change my slides. But for now, the bankers uh, are, are, get it. So one thing that really influences how I, I do my own research is the fact that I'm actually a patient. Uh, so I actually have Crohn's disease myself. And this is a recent trip, unfortunately, to Greenwich Hospital, because I, I wasn't Mount Sinai. I, li I live in Rye, so I had to go to the emergency room at Greenwich, uh, which is fantastic because there's nobody there. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, you're like, I was like the most important person there because, uh, so. and you really shouldn't feel bad for me because I have so much morphine uh, in me in this uh, picture that I feel way better there than I do here that right now this morning. So. <laughs> So one thing that happens, though, when you have inflammatory bowel disease, as many of you might know, is you get all sorts of cutaneous manifestations uh, of uh, sort of inflammatory bowel disease, erythema nosum and, and all types of rashes. So one thing that happens to me all the time as I'm about to have a flare is I get a rash all over my chest and my arms. So I'll go to the IBD doctors and, they, and I'll say, don't you think this is interesting? My gut inflammation is causing me to have these cutaneous manifestations of disease. What can we learn about uh, you know, the gut and the skin and why, how these things are connected and they'll say, well, what I think is you should go see a dermatologist. <laughs> and, uh, you know, okay. And then I go to the dermatologist and I said, don't you think this is interesting? The skin and the gut are clearly connected and every time I'm about to have a flare, my skin changes and we're looking for biomarkers for inflammatory bowel disease. Could they be hiding in the skin? And the dermatologist just gives me a script for corticosteroids and says, I specifically became a dermatologist so I didn't have to think about the colon. So would you please get out of my office um, and, and you know, put on these steroids and, and go back and see your IBD doctor, right? So, so that made me realize, of course, you know, although we study and organize our hospitals around these diseases in a, in a very siloed way, of course, when you're a patient, you realize that, that the lines between diseases are very blurry, in fact. And so actually, we, yeah, I did something about this. So back actually several years ago, uh, even when I was a grad student, we uh, performed a study where, and I apologize, it's a little blurry, but what we did is we took all of the genomic, the molecular data, genome-wide association studies, uh, gene expression studies, and all these different diseases that were being collected. And what we did is, is ask the question, does the molecular taxonomy of disease look anything like the symptoms and anatomy-based taxonomy of disease that we still organize our hospitals around? And if, what, what you're seeing here is if two diseases are connected, that means at a genome-wide level, the pathways, the genes, et cetera, that are disrupted or mutated in the disease uh, are, are uh, overlap more than you'd expect by, by uh, random chance. So there's more molecular similarity in the, in the, in the uh, genomic pathology of this, these diseases than you'd expect by random chance. So you see very, very bizarre things like Alzheimer's disease looks like actinic keratosis at a molecular level in terms of the pathways and genes, et cetera, that are being disrupted. That sounds very bizarre. And, and I used to say, oh, isn't that weird? And I'd move on. And then someone would say, that makes perfect sense to me, someone said in a talk one time. And they said, if you remember your developmental biology, the, the, human, the brain and the skin are actually together at one point in the neuroectoderm. So this, you know, could it be that in the differentiated tissue state, some of these molecular, shared molecular uh, characteristics are, are retained? Um, we continue to find all kinds of connections between skin and, and brain. In fact, there was a paper that was published two years ago that claimed you could see tau pathology in the skin of Alzheimer's patients. Tau pathology is a pathological sign of, uh, of Alzheimer's in the skin of Alzheimer's disease patients at greater abundance than controls, right? So it could be that skin uh, is a biomarker for Alzheimer's. So as time goes on, these, this molecular taxonomy looks less and less crazy as we get more molecular data. You also see malaria looking like Crohn's disease. Some malaria drugs have been repurposed for Crohn's disease. And we, so what we did, you did with this information is a lot of drug repurposing. I'm not going to talk about that work today. Uh, of course, this idea of, you know, diseases, you know, patients don't, you know, these diseases are still being organized into these discrete buckets, and we're looking at connections across it. But you can take this idea up to the patient level as well. So many of you know we have a nice resource at Mount Sinai called the Mount Sinai BioMe Biobank, where we have uh, electronic health record data, and the patients have consented to give us uh, DNA. Now, they're consented for recontact, so if we wish to, we can call them back in and potentially fill in some of these other dimensions. But for now, we have DNA uh, matched to the electronic health record data. And one of the first things I did uh, when I came to Mount Sinai 
was to use this information to create, take a first step in what I, uh, I strive for, which is to create a learning healthcare system, which is a, a buzzword that you might have heard uh, now uh, uh, spoken by lots of people. And you know, for me, um, the one thing I always think about is what I'm seeing as a patient here, and someone, you know, say they'll say, "Okay, Joel, you're, uh, you know, they'll think in their head maybe you're a Caucasian male, 40 to 45 years old, family history of this, you know, uh, disease. You know, this is your health history. Um, this is the, the things you're complaining about today, etc." And you know, let's treat you based generally on guidelines. You know, things for people we know like you. And as a data person, I'm saying you see millions of people each year, literally. Which patients look like me, and what happened to them, right? So when you go to Amazon, for example, to buy products, they don't say, "Hey, this is what 40-year-old uh, white dudes from Westchester like to buy." So, and we've created a special page for those people. No, they don't do that. They look at my browser history. They look at other things I've purchased. They look at people like me and what they like to purchase, and they actually serve up, you know, products in a completely data-driven way. They don't have marketing experts anymore, right, deciding these things. So the idea behind this, and I'm sorry I don't have a pointer, but um, um, is, so now the X and Y don't mean anything on this plot. And what I did is I took all the electronic health record data I had on these patients, and I, I represented each patient by all of their objective clinical measures. And what do I mean by that? Heights, weights, CBC, uh, metab metabolic panels, all various other blood test results. And I ignored diagnosis codes and clinical notes in this particular case, because I wanted everything that was an objective clinical measure and I considered the, the notes and the ICD codes to be subjective. Um, so I, I took all of their objective data, and you say uh, there's like 200 or so variables, and I basically said, which patient looks like this patient looks like this patient, and this is a patient-patient similarity network based purely on their, their objective sort of uh, quantitative data. Again, X and Y don't mean anything. Um, the topology is the only thing that's important. Each dot is a patient or a group of patients who are similar to one another in this high-dimensional clinical phenotype space. Um, I don't know why it looks like South America or a big fish, but that's, uh, you know, it's like when you see teddy bears in the clouds. So some people uh, ask me what's wrong with various South American countries when I start to go through this, but that's it's not geographic. Um, but so the, the, the question is, now think about this. So the, again, this is a, a map basically of patient similarity, and the idea would be, where's my little blue, if I'm a new patient coming into Mount Sinai, where's my little blue Google Maps dot blinking, and does it matter? at all. If, if I'm over there, I'm over here. I can tell you you don't want to be over here. Uh, the nicest name I have for this little island is Cardiometabolic Island, which gives you an idea about what could be going on over there. It's, a, it's a, some of the sickest patients at Mount Sinai. But then what we did is um, ask the question, after the data organized all these patients, where are the patients with type 2 diabetes? Why did we focus on type 2 diabetes? Because we have a lot of them, as you can imagine. And we could, uh, we're statistically powered to, to look at, at where they were located on the map. So these red uh, areas are hot zones of type 2 diabetes patients. And by the way, going into our electronic health record and asking where are the, who are the patients with type 2 diabetes is actually a super hard question to answer. It's extremely hard. You can't just look at one or two ICD diagnosis codes, right? The electronic health records, for anyone who has a computer science orientation that thinks that EHR records are sort of this pristine representation of patient disease, you know, I hate to burst your bubble. But uh, even figuring out who had type 2 diabetes was an extremely hard problem, which required its own set of algorithms. So the red zones are, are hot spots of patients with type 2 diabetes. Um, so they could be anywhere on this map, but they're statistically enriched in all these different regions, uh, more than you'd expect by random chance. In this particular graphic, we took out all the patients that didn't have type 2 diabetes and just focused on the patients that did have type 2 diabetes. And they organized into these three clusters. Uh, and you know, the provocative idea was, did we have type 2, type 3, and type 4 diabetes sitting under our nose the whole time, although we didn't realize it because we never looked at our patients in a data-driven way? Now you can, you can cluster you know, data all day long. You get cool pictures like that. But the question is, does it matter clinically, right? So and, and this paper is published, so you can read the details. So remember, we have electronic health record data on all these patients, and we have genetics. And the genetics was not used to cluster the patients. That becomes important later. So then we looked at all these different clusters, and we looked at their longitudinal electronic health record data retrospectively, and we said, are there any clinical differences uh, between these groups? And it turns out if you're a patient, a type 2 diabetes patient in the top group, you have st statistically increased risk of cardiovascular complications, heart attack, stroke. Uh, things like that. Now, all type 2 diabetics, as you know, have increased risk of cardiovascular uh, comorbidities. But if you're a type 2 diabetic in the top group, your risk was above and beyond the other type 2 diabetics. That's kind of interesting. This bottom group, for example, if you're in that group, um, you have uh, statistically increased risk of many different cancers. 
Many of you may know that diabetes increases your risk of cancer, and by the way, the diabetes drug metformin decreases your risk of cervical cancers. Nobody really knows why. It could be due to Warburg effect or something like that. But, but anyway, all, even though all type 2 diabetics have increased risk of cancer, if you're a type 2 diabetic in that subgroup down there, you have, you have statistically increased risk above and beyond uh, the type 2 diabetes general population. Um, and I'll say that's mildly interesting because that was retrospective analysis. Um, it could be explained by all sorts of things we didn't measure in the EHR, like socioeconomic status and, and, uh, and other sorts of things like that, but it was kind of interesting. But remember I told you we have genetics on all these patients, right? And one thing we did was we did genome-wide association studies, genetic association studies on these clusters after the, you know, their, the, the phenotypic data organized them. And then when it got really interesting is we found genetic markers unique to each group. Remember I told you that top group had increased risk of cardiovascular complications? Well, if you look at the genetic markers that uniquely associated with each group, um, they were heavily enriched in things like vascular endothelial signaling pathways, you know, calcium ion control, you know, channel of the heart, and things like that. So, and again, this, this group on the bottom had increased risk of, uh, had, had genetic markers that were enriched in known oncogenic pathways, things like that. Now, that's harder to explain away because the genetics did not inform the clustering. So that suggested that these genetic markers were pointing to actual biological differences. Uh, between the patients, and in fact, you might be able to use those, mar those, those markers to segregate patients into those groups, and which we'd have to run a prospective study. One limitation of this work was that um, this was done in a cross-section in time, and we know a disease like diabetes evolves over time, so we have a new version of this algorithm that operates basically into, across the time dimension, almost like you were looking down the, this in, uh, you know, in, in uh, three dimensions across time. So. Uh, because this original work was finished in uh, 2014, essentially, and we'll publish the new version soon. So one, one of the questions we always get when we talk about, oh, uh, you know, we want to take all the electronic health record data, we want to take all the genetics data from patients, uh, I, we're doing stuff in wearables and things like that, like how are we going to take in all this information? We have a hard enough time with information overload with the, inf you know, that, with the data that we have in the electronic health record. Well, one of the things that's going to help us is there's a new type of artificial intelligence, re relatively new, at least becoming uh, uh, relatively new in, in the mainstream, a type of artificial intelligence called deep learning, which is um, enabling all kinds of new applications. And for those of you who don't know what deep learning is, one of the first demonstrations of deep learning uh, that hit the mainstream was when Google taught an algorithm to find cats in videos. And this even made it to the BBC, if you can imagine, right? And I remember my mom sending me this saying, why do I care about cat videos and why is it in the BBC and all these other major news outlets? So let me tell you why this is a big deal. So what they did, so, so if you wanted to use previous generation machine learning to make an algorithm that can find cats in videos, what would you have to do? Is you'd have to get you know, thousands if not millions of cat videos and frame by frame, you'd have to have humans watch the, each video frame circle the cat, circle its paws, circle its ears, or whatever you decide are the important features of a cat, and frame by frame annotate every frame of that video, and then, you know, and then feed that human annotated set of um, videos frames into the algorithm and train it and, ho and hope that it learns you know, what a cat looks like and can predict them in new videos. That's not at all what they did in this, with this algorithm. All they did was say, hey, here's a bunch of, here's a millions of videos with cats, here's millions of videos without cats, you figure out what a cat looks like. And that's exactly what it did, is it took all the raw pixels from the uh, videos and it's able to combine them and make new, new, vari you know, uh, make new types of variables and, and uh, pull features out of the videos on its own without being told what to do. And it, that's actually what it did, is it actually learned what a cat looks like just purely from the information, knowing that some of these videos had cats and some of these didn't. Um, and of course now these deep learning algorithms are beating people in all different types of games. They're the technology behind self-driving cars. We actually had one of the first uh, and by the way, the reason that we're able to do all this new types of artificial intelligence um, with deep learning, the, the math is actually quite old in some ways for, for deep learning, but there's new computer hardware that accelerates the math that we need to, you know, use this, uh, th that we need to uh, uh, support more uh, you know, modern real-time applications. So actually there's a company called NVIDIA uh, that makes these graphics processing units that really speed up the types of math. And by the way, does anyone know exactly why uh, how NVIDIA, uh, why they make these chips and where they're used for the most part. So, yeah, so what were you telling me? You got to tell me. Computer games. Computer games, exactly. Right, so if it hadn't been for Xbox and PlayStation, we wouldn't have these high-end 3D graphics units 
uh, graphics processing chips. If we didn't have these high-end 3D graphics processing chips, we couldn't do all the AI we're doing in healthcare right now. So I just think it, it's a good example of how you can't plan innovation, right? So it was really Xbox and PlayStation that drove uh, the market to, to develop these chips, which are now being used for different applications in AI. So we published a paper, which was the first application of deep um, feature learning, deep, patient, deep uh, neural networks to electronic health record data. So in this particular paper, what did we do? Again, it's very similar to the cat video thing, uh, you'll see in a second. So what we did is we took all the electronic health record data that was in, in the Mount Sinai data warehouse, uh, medi medications, diagnosis, procedures, and we throw it into the deep learning algorithm. And what does it do? Is it says, well, I'm just going to take like platelet counts and um, you know, height and just combine them and make a new variable and see if it adds information you know, to, the, to, the, uh, to the learning, uh, for example. So it takes all these things at a high level and it creates these, why it's called deep neural networks. It takes all these different variables you, you might not combine and make new variables, and it'll create a layer of these new variables, and it takes the second layer of variables and just starts combining them on its own. So we create a deep neural network representation of our patient population. And the task that we wanted to do was try to predict new diagnosis of a disease in the next one year. So we, tr we threw in all the data up to 2014, and we tried to predict uh, who's going to get a new diagnosis of disease X in the next one year. And just like, just like the uh, cat video algorithm, we said, hey, here's a bunch of patients with liver cancer. And here's a bunch of patients without liver cancer. You figure out what they look like and how to predict one, a new diagnosis of one of these patients in the next one year. We actually did this for over 90 different diseases without talking to a single domain expert. And we showed that we could predict new diagnosis of uh, ADHD, multiple myeloma, liver cancer, whatever, with fairly high accuracy without ever knowing what should, be, what should or should not be important for those diseases. Is the deep learning algorithm learned from the data what, what's useful and, how we should, and what, what we should use to predict uh, these diseases. So, um, and you know, I, we can go more into that, but I'm going to skip skip ahead a little bit here to the sake of time. And what we're doing with this next. So, one thing we're doing th with it now is to the big limitation of deep learning is that you have no idea why it makes these predictions. This is there's actually this is a big challenge with this deep learning. So, it makes very very uh, accurate predictions, but you have no idea why or how. So, it can't tell you how it made the predictions. This is a big challenge for the deep learning field overall, is it's very predictive, but nobody knows what's going on inside the box, right? So this is the challenge. Uh, so another thing we're doing, you're just going to see a theme here, is I, I, we looked at the, the differences among patients and we f similarity among patients, and we found different genetic markers. We looked at the similarity among diseases. But this is a, a, another work where how can we take the, these cross-disease connections down to the molecular level and uh, identify specific mechanisms that might be connecting uh, these diseases that we can investigate, you know, for drug targets, disease mechanisms, et cetera. So many of you may not be aware, there's a nice resource that uh, NIH publishes called GTEx, which is basically a genomic catalog of different tissues, right? So um, for example, they're taking uh, uh, all these different tissues represented here, they're doing gene expression profiling, and they also have DNA on these patients, and they're basically creating a genomic map of uh, all these different tissues, and you can download this information. So I have a student that's taking all this data and building tissue-specific gene networks for all these different tissues. And then what she's doing, and has done, is, is now she's, she's making disease-specific, tissue-specific disease networks, stay with me, tissue-specific disease networks, and trying to look at the overlap of all these different diseases and all these different tissues, right? So what you're seeing here is sort of what is the molecular network of colitis uh, genes, lupus genes, uh, celiac genes, Alzheimer's disease genes, et cetera, look from the, in uh, visceral omentum tissue. And what you see here is there's not really much connection among these different things. From the perspective of visceral omentum tissue, the disease gene networks relative to these different diseases are sort of disconnected. But if you actually look in the adrenal gland, uh, for example, you find high connectivity among all these different diseases, and you can zoom down on specific molecular pathways that are linking these diseases together. Um, one thing we found in this particular, so, uh, paper, for example, is there's uh, epidemiological data and even our own electronic health record data that shows a connection between celiac and atrial fibrillation, for example. And we actually found a, a vagus nerve network using this uh, technique that we think is specifically regulating that connection, for example, that we can test. So one of the questions you can ask then is all these different diseases and all the different tissues, you can start to see what is the, what are the gene, what's the gene or genes that seems to be a common connector connecting all these different neurodegenerative diseases, metabolic diseases, and all these different tissues, and you can identify specific sort of pan-disease, pan-tissue genes, if you will. 
And if we do that and rank those genes, you actually find the top gene that seems to be the master connector of all these different diseases and all these different tissues is a gene called SPI1, which actually was just recently published by Allison Goat from Mount Sinai as a key regulator of um, uh, you know, microglia function in Alzheimer's disease. So maybe not surprising, because we're seeing this in, in other work, is that there's sort of this uh, monocyte differentiation in homeostasis almost seems to be the master um, uh, process that's connecting uh, Alzheimer's to diabetes to um, um, uh, autoimmune disease, et cetera, but now we can identify the specific networks uh, and, and genetic networks that we could potentially target to, to understand that. So well, before I get to the next phase of the talk, I want to create a contrast in your mind um, you know, that a modern Formula One race car has 200 data feeds, 5 gigabytes of data generated per lap, custom iPad app for, for tracking the course of the car in real time. Uh, racing boats have all these different sensors, all these different variables, two, lots of data generated uh, in a single day of running this boat. And of course, this is what happens if you're a human being and you're born in a modern hospital uh, in the United States. Um, you get your kind of APGAR score components, you get a heel prick, maybe they'll look at PKU and a few other genes, you know, to, to make sure you're okay there. And then you'll get a slap on the rear end and say, come back and see us when you're sick, right? So this is pretty amazing what we do for cars and boats, but not, not human beings. Um, so one of the you know, most important opportunities or biggest opportunities going forward, in my opinion, the genomics part is interesting, but genomics is pretty easy now. It's pretty commoditized and the machines are, are, are really good. So it's very easy to measure genomics, but it's, what, we, what we really lack is a huge amount of the phenotypic data that we need to layer on top of the genomics to, to figure out what's going on in people's day-to-day -day lives, right? So here's this, this silly paper we wrote about opportunities in digital phenotyping and why it's important and all the different sources of phenotyping information. You may be aware that we're on the you know, crest of a huge tsunami in consumer sensor technologies, uh, things like watches, uh, wearable devices, et cetera. I always like to point out that not even diapers are going to be safe uh, you know, from this sort of quantified revolution, a company called Pixie Scientific that makes a smart diaper. I'm sorry to say that my kids are too old for this, but uh, if they, what's, what? It doesn't change it, no. <laughs> But you know, this, the second the uh, adult diaper Kickstarter of this hits the internet, I'll be the top, top donor for sure. So uh, even companies like Wellness Effects that give you, uh, enable direct-to-consumer blood testing. And if, uh, many of you may be aware, uh, Apple's done a really cool thing. And by the way, Apple, of course, in the next version of iOS, will let you pull all your health records directly from Epic into your phone. That's the new feature that's coming to, um, to Apple iOS. By the way, Apple this morning announced that they're building their own network of clinics for their employees. So, and of course, everybody knows about the Amazon, JP Morgan, Berkshire Hathaway thing. So th really interesting things are happening outside the traditional medical space. Apple makes something called uh, Research Kit, which we actually help participate in the design of, which actually turns every iOS device into a clinical trials device, which is pretty amazing. So we actually had one of the, you know, the, in, in obviously collaboration with lots of people in the genomics department, had one of the first research kit apps, Monsanto Asthma Health. And remember the type 2 diabetes work I showed you with the electronic health record data? I am shocked I got anything useful out of our electronic health record data. I'll tell you why. So if you imagine uh, our, our data warehouse, our electronic health record data, imagine a spreadsheet with patients as the rows of that spreadsheet, and the columns are all the different data elements we have represented in our electronic health record data, our data warehouse. Now stack those spreadsheets by time, you know, to represent time, every day of data that we have. That cube of data is about 95% empty, actually. <laughs> so, because we have very little, we have very sparse data, you know, across time, even across measurements, right? So outside of, again, things like routine blood test results, we don't have a lot of dense measurements other than heights and weights and things like that. So the goal here is to imagine if we could create like a 95% full data cube <laughs> on our patients, right? So that's something we could potentially do with research kit, right? So the idea would be, instead of this sort of sparse, we see someone once a year data, um, we could, you know, have uh, their Bluetooth inhaler connected to their phone, we get activity and vitals, Bluetooth spirometry, when they have an asthma attack, we know the exact position they're standing at, we can bring in, uh, we can bring in, um, you know, block level, uh, if we have it, uh, pollution data, pollen data, etc. And imagine the sort of, uh, what we could do with a 95% full data cube. Um, we actually, you know, obviously with uh, genomics colleagues published uh, the initial results from this, and I think there was, I can't remember the exact numbers, but we enrolled something like 45,000 patients in six months or something like that in the clinical trial 
you compare that to a traditional clinical trial, obviously that's, that's pretty insane. So you can see all kinds of cool stuff in the patterns that we collect from this. If there's forest fires in western Washington, you can see increased risks of, uh, increased incidence of, uh, of sort of uh, asthma attacks in Idaho, for example, and things like that. But one thing, my favorite um, finding from this particular study is that even the most motivated patients who have chronic disease stop using these apps really quickly. <laughs> so the attrition rate is extremely high. So again, it, it, you know, even though we have these digital tools, and this is really cool, and there's one billion devices that are now potentially clinical trial research devices, um, it, there's still a big challenge in, in user uh, experience and getting people to continue to monitor uh, this type of information. But I do believe we need to collect this sort of long dynamic data to better understand health and disease. And I apologize, I'm going to give you a short genetics lesson to really drive home why we need this, this dynamic, uh, dynamic phenotypic data in addition to the genomic data. So you, know, you, you probably had one day of genetics training in, uh, in your med school, so now you have two. They'll give you a second. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just, that, was, that was a cheap shot. So, uh, so one thing we look for in, in, in genomics data are things called, for one of the many things, but one thing that people look for to try to understand the function of the genome is expression quantitative trait loci, EQTLs. Now, expression quantitative trait loci sounds like a complex thing. It's pretty simple, actually. So basically what you're looking for is situations like at the top level, they're saying someone, so for one SNP, one, one base pair, uh, you know, one position, single base pair position in the genome, if someone has two copies of AA, one copy of A from mom, one copy of A from dad, that they have low levels of exp mRNA expression of this particular gene in this cartoon case. If they have two copies of GG, they have high levels of expression. You can almost think of it, instead of gene expression, if it were height, they'd be tall or they'd be short. But in this case, we're looking at expression levels of a gene. And if they have the heterozygote, they have medium levels of expression of a gene. Why do we care about finding EQTLs in the genome is that if there's a correlation between the DNA variation and the gene expression variation, there's a potential that there's a functional relationship between the DNA and the RNA. And of course, this is what we're, we're trying to do is figure out what parts of the genome are functional and, and, and what is the function. So there's big projects. In fact, the GTEx consortium project I showed you before, one of the main things they're trying to do is find all these different EQTLs in the genome. So what you're seeing right here is a very classic EQTL relationship, right, from this science paper. Um, so what you're throwing, for this particular SNP, represented by this RS XYZ number here, people with the AA genotype have high levels of expression of HIP1 on average. People with GG have low levels of expression of HIP1 on average, this particular gene. And with AJ, AG have medium. This is a classic EQTL relationship, right? So the, the gene expression segregating by genotype. But then what they did, and these are lymphoblastoid cells, I believe, they stimulated these cells. So someone might publish a paper, for example. We know there's these papers. Oh, well, well, if you have a genotype uh, of this SNP, you'll have high levels of expression of HIP1 on average. People might even use this for pharmacogenomics or something like that. But they stimulated these cells with lipopolysaccharide, bacterial cell component uh, that causes innate inflammation. And actually, two hours later, that EQTL relationship's gone, actually. And now, actually, 24 hours after LPS stimulation, it's the exact opposite direction, right? So 24 hours after LPS, GG now have highest levels of expression of HIP1, right? So this relationship depends on when you're looking at it and what's happening, right? So, so this is probably an oscillating type, you know, uh, EQTL relationship, right? There's another case, I think, to, to the, se the second panel. At baseline, there's no EQTL but only after LPS stimulation does the EQTL reveal itself, right? So these genomic function is highly context dependent, highly dynamic, highly ephemeral, right? So just studying cells in a dish isn't gonna tell you, isn't gonna reveal all the secrets of the genome. And what's, what this means is we need this dynamic phenotypic data to layer on top of the genetics for the genome to reveal all of its inner workings essentially, right? So um, one of the things uh, also that uh, I think is important for understanding genome function um, is understanding what normal healthy is. Well, I'll argue we have no idea what normal healthy is. I'll get to that in a second. But I'm, I'm really driven a lot uh, to study normal healthy people by this, by this figure, where we, again, we have percent of the population with the number of chronic diseases by age. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now, when I stare at a graph like this, I think, well, almost all of NIH funding and all of pharma R&D is spent in that upper right-hand quadrant. There's almost no money being spent on how to make this green space bigger, right? Which to me seems absolutely insane. Um, so precision medicine, we talk a lot about um, genetics, but I would argue that, you know, we're not collecting the other types of information. So we know, for example, that sleep and cognition and metabolism all have biological quantitative relationships. 
activity, et cetera. But we're collecting a lot of information on genetics, but we're not collecting a lot of the other data to help us actually learn the, the, the ac actual probabilities and, and uh, relationships between these nodes and how we can indi you know, individualize that for a specific uh, person. Um, and here, here's a, a great paper. Yeah, this RGB connection is really low res. I apologize. But again, I, the point I, was, I made earlier was that I really don't think we know what a normal healthy person is, right? So I, we, we have really understand. So how can we better understand transitions to disease if we actually don't know the true dynamics and complexity of what is normal healthy, right? So the, how do we currently define what a normal healthy person is? Here's, Here's all the things we agree are diseases, which are clusters of concepts based on anatomy findings, uh, maybe genetic markers, maybe if we're lucky. And if you don't fit into one of those categories, you're healthy. Right? It's, if you think about it, health is absence of disease. That seems purely insane to me. So how can we actually quantify what health is on that whole spectrum leading up to these things that we agree are diseases? So this is a group that, a paper that was published in Cell by an Israeli group. And what they did is on 800, or so metabolically you know, normal healthy people. They got gut microbiome, blood testing, food questionnaires, uh, food diaries, and all sorts of things uh, uh, related to their uh, food and metabolic um, characteristics. And what they were trying to do in this paper was try to predict individual postprandial glucose response. As you all know, is how does your blood sugar spike after you essentially eat something? So there's all kinds of cool findings in this paper. But this is one of my favorite uh, figures. So what they're showing you here is that in these 800 normal healthy people, the, the calories, the carbohydrates of the meal and the calories of the meal explain about 30% of the population variance in postprandial glucose response. Less than half, right? Why do I think this is significant? Is if I go, if I'm worried about my blood sugar control and I go to the, the, the dietitian here at Mount Sinai, what are they gonna tell me to help manage it? Probably watch my carbs and my calories, right? And sugars, right? That explains less than 30% of the actual variance of the population level postprandial glucose response. What they're showing at the bottom here is when they combined personal microbiome measurements, personal blood test measurements, et cetera, they could explain almost 70%. So even something simple, although it's not that simple as, as you know, as blood sugar control, postprandial glucose response in normal healthy people, we have no idea about the true complexity and dynamics and, uh, and variation of that in, in, a, in a population. So how are we gonna understand it in disease? So, all these things are setting up for uh, um, why we created the Institute for Next Generation Healthcare, and which launched less than a year ago here at Mount Sinai with sort of this basic idea of how can we put the foundations of 2025 medicine in, in, the, in healthcare into practice today. So, uh, you know, many of you can appreciate that healthcare service, you know, we have lots of great biomedical discoveries and scientific discoveries, but the service delivery of, of healthcare is quite. Uh, resistant to innovation, as you might be aware. These are actually, by the way, time-stamped, uh, verified time-stamped photos. So that is an actual picture from 1980. I chose that because I was four years old in 1980, and that's when I remember going to the doctor for the first time. Uh, and it, you know, maybe we got nicer p art or pictures, maybe not, but it's pretty striking uh, that uh, very little has changed in, in the exam room, uh, right, in so many years. My oil change company, by the way, has more service innovation than my, my doctor's office, right? So, if, uh, and one of the arguments I like to make is that e even though there's a lot of you know, so-called health AI and big data and healthcare uh, happening right now, I would argue that a lot of these are essentially just building mechanical horses to pull a carriage. And what I mean by that is if you have a sort of antiquated old framework or way of doing things, and you're trying to force new technology to operate in an old framework, that the best you can end up, end up with is mechanical horses to pull a carriage rather than the flying car that we're all trying to, trying to build here. So uh, I would argue that hospitals are like old mainframe computer systems from the 1970s, centralized equipment, privileged class of operators who are only allowed to operate the, the computers. If you didn't have a PhD in computer science back in the day, you were not allowed near a computer. So my argument to Ken and Dennis was that we should stop trying to, we should stop aspiring to be the best brick and mortar hospital in New York, we should stop aspiring to be the best brick and mortar hospital anywhere. Um, we should aspire to be the intel inside of a new healthcare system, right? That was digital and, and, and software based as much as possible. Strangely, they agreed to me, they agreed with me, and I told you I was like the guy from Office Space who keeps trying to get fired. And uh, but they decided to to let me move forward with this. And of course, you know, we're in, we're living in a world where the largest transportation company in the world doesn't own cars largest hospitality company in the world doesn't actually own any buildings. Uh, why do we think healthcare is going to be any different? 
So one of the first uh, manifestations of this idea uh, of this vision was to build uh, this next generation health clinic, which is called Lab 100. It's actually in the library. Some of you in the room have seen it. Um, and the goal of this was to empower patients, of course, and build a better healthcare experience. And uh, that, that's, you know, that's the low hanging fruit. We also want to develop products um, and help uh, startups with innovative products get into the clinic faster. And of course, we want to collect types of information that's never been uh, collected before. And really what we wanted to do was to create a rapid prototyping environment for the future of medicine, right? So, um, you know, th th it's very hard when you're trying to keep the trains running on time in an existing health system to try to be innovative, right? And, and, and uh, try things out in the wild, right? So this is, we wanted to create an environment where we could do that. So if you haven't seen it, this is what the clinic looks like. It's actually in Annenberg, 11th floor. This is a photograph of what the clinic looks like. I promise you it's not a 3D rendering. It's an actual photograph. Um, and this is the sort of patient intake area. So when you come in and uh, be, you, on iPad, you enroll in the clinic and you give us all kinds of information. And this is uh, David Stark is, is one of the uh, drivers behind Lab 100 and, and the, the main clinician. Uh, at Lab 100 currently. This is where you sit down with your physician and talk about all of your, your sleep data, your nutrition data, your, your disease history, your, or your health history, and things like that. So it looks quite a bit different from the vinyl exam uh, uh, chair, that, you know, things like that. Um, then there's all these different stations where you get all these uh, different types of measurements. In fact, we actually collect about a million data points per patient encounter. But at the same time, it's an overall better experience for the patient. The patient doesn't feel like a lab rat. They actually have a better overall healthcare experience. And this is actually the final area, and I'm not going to go through all the stations. Uh, I'll talk about it in a second, uh, where all your information is synthesized. We even, we even do blood testing in the clinic, and um, all your blood test uh, results are interpreted and put in your patient, uh, are measured, put in your patient record, and interpreted before you get to the end of the, the whole visit. Actually, none of this, hey, we'll call you in a week if something's wrong, right? Thing, right? Instantly. So the whole, uh, 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 concept behind the clinic is every time we measure something on you, it should be instantaneous, instantaneously, put, instant, uh, instantaneously put in your patient record and displayed and, and interpreted for you so you can have a discussion with your physician about what the results mean. And, and this is actually, we have all these different stations. We have um, uh, blood testing, but we also have, uh, we get 3D body scans, and actually I think this is, this is the slide. Uh, so the goal here wasn't to build like a prettier skin around something like primary care. One of the goals of Lab 100 was to imagine, what if we actually had a health record? I mean health, like measuring your health, not procedures that have been done on you as a result of having some disease, right? So what would a longitudinal actual health record look like? This is the goal. It's not just, again, to try to just make a cooler looking version of primary care. So if we we're actually going to have a health record, what are some of the things we would measure on you and have as part of your health record, right? So one of the, so we started looking at, so, you know, obviously, uh, uh, we, uh, metabolic things, so we actually have 3D body scans, we have uh, um, metabolic uh, testing and things like that. We also have neurocognitive testing and things like that, so we, we figure, well, wouldn't it be great to have a memory, attention, executive function, and other sorts of things as part of your, uh, your actual health record. And even on the 3D body scans, there are many known anthropometric risk measures you can get off patients, like waist to hip ratio, things like that, right? Turns out there are about 20, 25 of these things that are well known. But it, you can't bring a tape measure with you to every patient uh, well, wellness exam, right? But if we do a 3D body scan, we can instantly calculate 20, or 25 or 30, uh, 20 to 25 well-validated risk measures. The whole point behind Lab 100 was let's measure things that we know are useful today and have clinical validity for making decisions today. But at the same time, we're collecting millions of other data points that are more speculative, that may not be useful, right? So if we get a big enough data set, we, we can actually do genome-wide associations on the 3D body scans and maybe find for example, that you know, if you have a, uh, uh, disparities between the right side and the left side of your body, that could be a marker for a disease we didn't know about, for example. So, and uh, I know I'm running out of time here, but I just want to show the, the, the final vision of where we're going with Lab 100. So another thing we've built, I have an office in Redwood City, California, of a bunch of software engineers and data scientists. You may not know, by the way, there's a Mount Sinai, California that I started. So if you want an excuse to go to California, just say you're visiting Joel's office in, uh, in Redwood City and that you're working. So one of the things that they're working on is a, is a software for end of one clinical trials. So single patient level clinical trials. A lot of people have written about, oh, it's time for end of one trials. It's, you know, in cancers especially, but no one's actually built a, uh, a software for it. And why, why am I interested in building it? 
is because we're really terrible about closing the loop, I would say, in medicine, right? So remember, I'm an artificial intelligence guy. So you know, if, if we see a patient in our outpatient clinic, I'm very unlikely to know if they were given a prescription, if they filled it, if they took the drug, if it's working, et cetera. So how can I use fancy uh, algorithms if I, we never close the loop on outcomes, or algorithms if we don't close the loop on outcomes on patients? So, and we've built a software that, uh, that sort of allows us to um, conduct single patient level trials. So for example, if, if we were prescribed, well, simple example, melatonin from our clinic says to help you sleep, that will actually be delivered to you in this N of one app is the goal is to have it delivered to you in this end of one app. So what you don't realize is it's just saying, oh, the doctor says I should take this much on these days and record my sleep or have it connected to my sleep monitor. But in the background, it's calculating a single patient level crossover study design. So every time we deploy an intervention on our patients, we want it to be deployed as a clinical trial and we record the results of that clinical trial back in the health record, right? That's the goal. So the, the vision here is we have this you know, next gen smart clinic. We have things like our N of one platform that's capturing the actual outcomes from our interventions and we have an artificial intelligence and EHR that's sort of linking these things together. But I'll say one clinic in New York City in Mount Sinai is super boring. Um, so what we want is something like this. And we're already talking to people in all these different countries to set up clinics like this. I actually want to create a new internet of healthcare that's parallel to the current healthcare system of hundreds if not thousands of these smart clinics all connected to the same artificial intelligence brain. This is the goal. And actually the way we design Lab 100, if you go see Lab 100, it looks pretty permanent. And, and pretty um, uh, high end. We actually built, it, we installed Lab 100 in two weeks, actually. So Lab 100 is all fabricated by machines and robots. And the only thing a Lab 100 needs to get set up is a power and internet. That's it. All we need is power and internet. I could put one in a trailer. Um, if you wanted to install one at Goldman Sachs, I could do it in two weeks if I had a room. So we actually built these clinics for rapid deployment and rapid replication and scale up. Right, and, and, and you know, Lab 100 is just the first prototype. We're going to continue to iterate on this. We actually have designs for a kiosk version of Lab 100 uh, that we're building. Right, so this is my dream. So just like every, just like self-driving cars, the Google self-driving car, right, or, or any other self-driving car, every self-driving car that drives a mile, every other car connected to that same system has driven that mile. Also, it has the shared experience of driving that mile because they're all connected to the same brain. Right, so this is the idea behind these clinics. Could we build? Uh, a, a network of these smart clinics that would allow the same the same sort of thing. So, and uh, thank you for your time and attention. Sorry, I'm wrong. Okay, question. Wonderful, and I think subtyping disease is becoming in genetics now uh, very powerful. But the thing we've learned about genetics in terms of predictive medicine, I know you're talking beyond that is that our old predictors like BMI and family history are much more powerful. Yeah. Um, so how do you plan to validate this? What are yeah. your plans for showing that you really have built a better mouse family? Well, in uh, Lab 100, what you actually find is that we downplay genetics pretty hard in the whole experience, right? Because... But other markers, any marker. Yeah, so I think uh, the goal with with building these, these types of clinics and uh, getting you know, patients through as, as much as to you know, build up a data set where we can start to connect it to outcomes. Now, the initial version of Lab 100, we're just focusing on healthy people right now because we want to look at this idea of creating an actual health record. Um, but we have plans for bringing other cohorts of patients through the Lab 100 type setups, and we'd love to talk to anyone who has ideas on which types of patients we should bring through. We actually have a pretty big opportunity here at Mount Sinai because uh, uh, Mount Sinai is a self-insured employer, too. So the idea we actually have been kicking around is could we bring in, bring in cohorts of uh, patients, but in employees, and show uh, outcomes in terms of um, you know, financial you know, uh, improvements in addition to health improvements and things like that. Um, so my, the one bet is that filling in more of this longitudinal phenotypic information is going to be very useful, uh, and, and more useful potentially than genetics on looking at patient health and disease. And we're looking at lots of things that are already well validated that just don't get measured. But digital tools make it easy to measure. So. In that slide you showed chronic diseases, I think you said that most of the money was being spent on those people who had more than seven chronic diseases. Yeah. I don't believe that's correct. I mean, who's studying multimorbidity? Yeah. And does, does, does the kind of stuff you're doing yeah. that will have an impact on the outcome of multimorbidity? Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, uh, and then the goal of that graph, that's a good point, wasn't really to show that the, 
multimorbidity patients who were sucking up all the no, R&D. It was, it, was, it was to show more that uh, people with disease <laughs> are, are getting all the, all the money and, and no, one's, no one's spending any money to figure out what is health, right, is my argument there. Uh, what is a normal healthy person and how does we keep someone healthy, right? So that, that was the argument for that slide. Multimorbidity question is super interesting. We actually have an algorithm that we're about to publish where we're actually learning uh, these sort of, sort of comorbidity pathways from the electronic health record data, right? So instead of saying, oh, well, our textbook says a patient gets diabetes, then they get this renal dysfunction, and they get this and this and this, we're actually just looking at the data and we're learning. Here's a patient, they start out this way, then they go to this, in this swim lane, and then they get this drug, and 30% of them move over to this comorbidity swim lane, but we're learning it purely from the data without being told what should or shouldn't exist, and that's been, been super interesting to actually build that map from, from data. Um, this is fascinating, by the way. Um, how can your methodologies be used for cancer, and particularly for those that are um, much more aware uh, side of things? Yeah, so um, <laughs> that's a lot, lot of long answer to that, which I'll talk about. But we actually have a, a project, it's not rare cancers, but we have a project in multiple myeloma right now where we're collecting a lot of this super dense, uh, rich information on multiple myeloma patients. And my, in that case, it's easier to get sort of serial molecular measurements and things like that from biopsies. Uh, so, so we are investigating it. I would actually love to look at um, uh, using something like a Lab 100. Um, you know, there are a lot of situations in cancer where if you give one drug or the other drug, it's you know, from a sort of effectiveness and safety standpoint, it's about the same. But what we don't look at is um, sort of quality of life things associated with that. So if using some of our digital tools in Lab 100, could you show that even though these two drugs are considered to be clinically equivalent, you have one totally messes up sleep, totally messes up cognitive function, totally messes up all these other sorts of things that we don't look at as part of the clinical trial or even you know, in, in how the drug works. You know, so could we, could we layer on that sort of quantitative quality of life information? The one year predictions were uh, extraordinarily impressive, but you showed us AUCs, but you didn't show us sensitivity, specificity, sure. positive predictive value, yeah, yeah, yeah. negative predictive value. Yeah, yeah. If you take the top few, the ones that are best, mm -hmm. what what is the order of magnitude for positive and negative predictive values? Yeah, so so it's in the paper, right? And that's super important, uh, depending on the disease and. The, the disease prevalence and all these sorts of things and the likelihood of seeing it. So we have, we have a lot of those in the paper. I can't remember off the top of my head uh, exactly what those numbers were and which one performed the best. Would, would any of them meet what are considered now standard screening <coughs> criteria? Yeah. yeah, and the way we actually presented it in the paper was we did a precision measure of precision at K, which was uh, how, if you presented these potential diagnoses as basically a ranked pick list for the clinician of what are the likely um, you know, things they're gonna be diagnosed with in the next one year, um, and offered that as a sort of a pick list, what's the precision that the right thing would be in the top five of that pick list or something like that. So we sort of designed it in that particular case to as sort of this precision at K in a top five list or something like that to try to make it fit a more realistic uh, scenario. Not that, you know, that we'd be presenting options to the clinician, uh, but, Again, the, the particular disease that performed the best, I can't remember off the top of my head, but you're absolutely right. The AUCs alone aren't important, aren't, don't tell you enough about how clinically useful that is. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks.